let's talk about open-world role-playing game quest design. A lot of people bring linear quests into their open-world games. This doesn't really work very well because open-worlds are inherently non-linear. Let me give you an example. You're making a fantasy open-world game and you've got this cool gothic castle quest. There's a castle on the hill. It's the vampire castle. In fact, the vampire queen lives inside. But she doesn't want to be the vampire queen anymore. She would like to return to being human, but she can't let her subjects know that or they would stake her and set her out to die. So you wrote this storyline where the player can go in pretending to be her thrall and sort this mess out for her. It's got hundreds of lines of dialogue, branching paths. It's got suspense and drama and stealth and fights. Oh, you're super proud of it. It's great. And then every single player that plays your game sees a castle on the hill, waltzes over to it, notices it's full of vampires, and just kills everything. To them, the queen is just the boss of this castle. They don't even realize she has a plotline. Because we can stumble across everything in this world at random, that means that everything in this world is decontextualized. The player doesn't know anything about the castle, and the castle doesn't know anything about the player. We have no idea whether the player has just killed 85 dragons and is coming here after the post-game, or whether they're just coming in off of their character building and they haven't even had one level up yet. And the player doesn't know what this castle is about. We don't even know if the player is coming in through the front entrance, because if it's an open world game, the player is probably going to try and find something a little bit more interesting to, to do. They might try and sneak in through a cistern or jump over a wall. Or if your open world is permissive, they might hang glide in, or unleash a bunch of elephants, or light everything on fire, or get some heavy construction equipment up here and smash the walls down. The more freedom we give our players to explore our open worlds however they want, the less we can control that experience. The less linear things become. There are a couple of ways to try and force this linearity, and it's worth knowing them because, I mean, even if you're trying to do something non-linear, you will occasionally want little fragments of linearity, so let's discuss them. One option is to simply turn your open world game into a linear game. Congratulations, you found the vampire castle, you are now per part of a linear RPG until this sequence is done. You must enter through the front door, you must talk to the staff, you must decide whether you want to try and steal the key to get inside, or whether you want to try and seduce a vampire to get inside. It's a linear sequence. Now this has a couple of problems. One of the big problems is that it basically shuts off the rest of the game. All of the play and the entirety of the rest of the world has to be shaved away. We can't rely on the player having a specific power level because we don't know when they'll get here. We can't allow the player to bring any significant resources in from outside because who knows if they'll have them. We can't allow the player to go back outside and then come back. So for example, we can't allow the player to try and look up the castle and try and find floor plans or find the great 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 grandson of the vampire queen or rabble rouse and get a flock of villagers with torches to come by. We can't allow those things because they would all require the player to go back out into the open world where they'll promptly be distracted. Instead, everything in this sequence has to be very carefully constrained so that it's just its own little game. And if the player has the ability to do combat and skill checks, all of those things are going to have to be scaled to the player's level, or the player will have to be scaled to their level. This is pretty dissatisfying. Uh, and now, even past that, we're not allowed to play freely. For example, if we're trying to play as a thief here, this linear sequence can't allow the player to just thiefy thief however they want to thief. Instead, the writers would be responsible for creating thief paths. Oh, if you're a thief, you can choose to do it this way. Not, I'm going to be a thief, but this path has been set aside for thieves. Don't you feel proud that you specked into thief? Look at these options you've got. Same with mage. 
it's a very um, Deus Ex style approach where the levels try to reward the player for choosing a specific build, but they do so in a way that isn't really allowing them to express that build so much as just statistically allowing them to make the choice to take that path. It's not very satisfying is what I'm getting at. It's all very pre-scripted and enforced by the devs. Now, if this is limited enough and short enough, that's not necessarily going to be a bad idea. A lot of these games have, for example, sequences in cities where you'll talk to person A and then talk to person B. And it's an enforced bit of linearity, but it's like a minute long. So nobody cares. Nobody is going to start to think, oh, I need to break out my thief moves here. It's too short and too focused to even give them that opportunity. That's when it works well. But in a sequence like this, you've really got to, to cement the player uh, down. You've got to make sure they can't do anything freely. It's all got to be according to your particular writing, and that's not really what open world RPGs are best at. Another option here would be to restrict the player's access until you know that they are capable of doing the mission. So instead of trying to level scale everything within the castle to whatever the player's level is, we can just say, oh, the player isn't level 30 yet, they can't get into the castle. The gate card says, go away. Then when they turn level 30, they get a letter from the queen that says, I have heard much of your exploits and require your help. I wish to become human. Here is my signet ring. Give it to the gate guard and they will think that you are my thrall. In theory, this works well. It allows us to build context. The player knows what the castle is about, and the castle knows at least something about the player. But an open world map is not linear. Even if the player wants to go straight to the queen's castle, and that's not very likely, they're not going to go straight to the queen's castle. The open world map is built specifically to constantly distract them with other things that they could be doing right now. So there is no point at which they will travel straight to the queen's castle. Even if we wanted to allow the player or push the player to um, do other research, like look up who built the castle and what the floor plans are and that sort of stuff, it's very unlikely they would because most of the time the player's response to hearing something like the queen has invited you to the castle is, all right, well, if I'm ever in the neighborhood, maybe I'll think about it rather than, oh, cool, let's go do that right now. The amount of time and distractions between when the player is given the context of the castle and when they actually get to the castle means that there is no narrative flow there. There's knowledge, but no emotion. And we really want that emotion. That's the whole reason that we're trying to do this, right? The story of the vampire queen that wants to become human is an ultimately tragic story, right? It's got a character arc. We're trying to learn about the queen and what, her, what she's going to be interested in and how she's going to work through it. And of course, if she meets an untimely end at the final moment in an attempt to redeem herself for her centuries of vampirism, that's what we want. We want that final beat to matter. And that's why we're trying to set up these linear progressions, because an emotional chain, an emotional arc, is fundamentally the way that we connect to characters. If we just show up and see a queen die, we'll be like, well, okay, I've killed a million vampires. Should I have cared about that one? Are there other ways we can create linearity without forcing it quite so heavily? Sure. One way to do that is to simply offer up nonlinear sequences in a linear sequence. So, for example, if we've got the Queen's Ark, we could chop it up into a couple of pieces. Say, Castle 1, Castle 2, Castle 3, Castle 4, Castle 5. Something like that, right? Each of these castles can be approached in a nonlinear fashion because the player can approach the castle however they want. But they're always going to approach Castle 1 first and then Castle 2, and then Castle 3. So they'll always have absorbed whatever this little piece of the arc is, no matter how they approach the castle itself. We're not trying to tell the whole story in one particular encounter. We're breaking up the encounter into a series of encounters. 
a good way to do this would be to teleport the castles into place whenever the player happens to approach a place where a castle should be. Uh, let me let me explain. It's not the Vampire Queen's castle. It's the five castles of the Vampire Lords on the hills. And uh, in theory, you know, each of these hills is a particular castle for a particular Vampire Lord, right? But in practice, all we're doing is teleporting the castle that is next on the list onto whatever hill the player approaches. I mean, it's all covered in fog and bats, so it's okay. We can just teleport the castles around. This gives the player a touchstone and a progression. They know that if there is a foggy castle on a hill, it's part of the vampire castle plotline. There's a touchstone. So the first castle is one where the player has almost no context. They've never seen a vampire castle before. So it's our sacrificial castle. We expect that the players will do wacky things. So it's okay whether the player kills all the vampires or talks to them or steals everything or burns the whole castle down. It's all okay because this castle exists solely to let the player know that vampires can be talked to, that there are four more castles like it, and that, uh, you know, it might be worth actually conversing with these dudes. Then the player sees the second castle and they immediately remember, remember oh right, vampire castle storyline. I remember that we can talk to the vampires, but maybe they're not really into it yet, so they still decide to sneak in and that sort of stuff. But the main point of this second castle is to make sure that we start to understand a little bit of the Queen's pathos and really hammer home that there are people that we want to talk to in these castles. And by the time they reach the third castle, the player is almost certainly going to go in the front door. Because by this point, they've learned that these castles are mostly social encounters, at least initially. There's no benefit to going through and just murdering everybody in these castles. You're not going to get very much out of it. So the player is going to naturally start to restrict their own activities because they understand the context of what they're doing. They've started to internalize the idea that foggy castles on hills should be approached in a specific way for best reward. In this case, you're going to want to go through the front entrance and talk to the staff. It's important that these castles all have a similar visual theme, so the player always remembers that this is the vampire castle sequence. It's also important that these castles teleport to whatever hill the player approaches. In theory, we could have each hill have a specific castle on it and then just lock four of them until the, the player finds the right one. But that's going to sabotage the whole thing because that means that when the player approaches a vampire castle, there's a pretty big chance that they're going to approach the wrong one and it's just going to be locked. That's going to do us no favors. It actively damages the context of these castles. It's much, much better to teleport the castle into place, in my opinion. Another example of this might be, let's say you're running a you know, 1930s game and uh, there's some speakeasies around the town. All of the speakeasy doors would have a particular visual. They'd be painted green, and there'd be a guard saying, Password, and there'd be a little honky-tonk piano sounds coming out of it. The first speakeasy is our sacrificial speakeasy. But every single time the player encounters one of these speakeasy doors, we simply have that door lead to the next speakeasy that they're supposed to discover. And with each one of these sequences, the player learns more and more about what to expect from our speakeasy questline. We can start to restrict the player's open world access and open world capabilities, and they won't even notice because they'll be in the flow of the approach we want them to use. We can say that no, the player cannot hang glide into the third or fourth or fifth castle because that would disrupt the flow of the game. But very, very few players would even think to try, because by that point they're thinking, Vampire Castle, let's go talk to some vampires and then kill them. This allows us to create a linear sequence out of non-linear chunks. It's that easy. But there are a lot of other options, and that's obviously just one example. Another option would be to create a linear sequence by simply not putting it on the map. If it's not on the map, we can make it as linear as we like. An example of that might be the player character is wandering around, and every time they go to sleep at night, they have a dream. Oh, 
Oh, what's this dream about? Uh, it's a linear dream, so it just says whatever we need it to say. It doesn't matter what the player is doing or where they are, they get the dreams. So they get a linear sequence in their dreams. Or we could just give them a party member. Like, uh, for example, they might be introduced to uh, a wayfish lady with pale uh, skin and a crown and red eyes. And she's like, hey, dude, let me party up with you. That's what queens sound like, right? Once the queen is in your party, you're having a linear experience with that person. It doesn't matter where you go or what you do, her experience with you is linear, so she can mature in a linear way. We see this very frequently with linear RPGs where your party members will join your party and then they'll slowly open up to you over the course of several chapters until they give you their loyalty mission. This is a very typical way to separate the character progression from the story progression which is even more important in an open-world RPG. Now, in something like Mass Effect or Dragon Age, there is a big disadvantage. The character progression in those games cannot result in a significant change to the world, because we don't know exactly when or if the player is going to care enough about that character to actually do the loyalty mission. So we can't have a world that changes because of the loyalty mission, not in any sort of appreciable way, because that means we would have to fork all of our narrative elements. We would have to script up a world where that change had happened and a world where it didn't, which is very expensive. But in an open world RPG, a lot of our interactions are non-narrative. They're based on exploring the world as we see fit. So what that means is that if our Vampire Queen questline comes to fruition, we could just kill every vampire in the entire game. Just mark them dead. Oh, is there a vampire in this castle? Check and see whether or not the Vampire Queen questline happened, and if it did, kill off the vampire. Just mark them as dead. Now this obviously destabilizes any sort of uh, place where there are vampires. You go into a crypt and you see piles of ash. But that's not bad. There's no narrative reason why we absolutely require these vampires to offer a particularly carefully tuned challenge. If the player walks into a place and finds that the vampires are dead because of something they already did, they're going to feel like that's great. They're going to be like, awesome. That's right. I killed these vampires. Which is much more powerful than making sure that the that the flow of combat happens to work well. Obviously, we do have to be careful. There are a lot of narrative elements in open worlds that would have to be taken care of. You would not want to have anything depend on a vampire being alive and then have that vampire be dead. But as long as everybody on the team understands what sort of narrative outcomes can happen, you can usually work it out. Like, oh, is there a vampire dragon? Well, you can just say that they're stronger than the queen, so they weren't affected. There's always going to be considerations and confusions, and big changes to the world are always going to have some kind of price tag attached. But the point here is that there is no constriction to what we can do with our world. We don't have to create a branching world, one where we helped the vampire queen and one where we didn't help the vampire queen. We can just have the same world with an extra rule applied, and that's okay, because it might make the world act a little bit strange, but it's acting a little bit strange because of something the player did on purpose. So we've been talking a lot about how to introduce linearity to a nonlinear game, but we also have to talk about how to create nonlinear experiences. Now obviously there are a million different kinds of nonlinear experiences, uh, but if we want those experiences to be emotionally moving, then we're going to have to try and figure out how to connect with the player on an emotional level as they are wandering around doing whatever they want. How do we do that? Well, you could think of it as, uh, you know, environmental storytelling. I'm sure you've all heard this trope before, right? If you show a skeleton holding onto a bottle of booze, that's environmental storytelling. And that's right, that is environmental storytelling. It doesn't matter what the player is doing. 
It doesn't matter if they are shooting everybody or sneaking around or using magic. If they see a skeleton holding onto a bottle of booze, they are going to immediately understand what that's about. It's going to create an emotional impact. Not a huge one, but, a, but an emotional impact. The difficulty here is that this is very much a one-moment, one-trick pony. You can't have a sequence of these very easily, not one that communicates very well. You can try, and you can play Fallout if you want to see how they try. They can have sequences where, you know, people will just happen to have left their last words and thoughts on a tape recorder ready for you to hit play or whatever. Exploring these dungeons is usually done with an understanding that the dungeons have been built to do this particular area first, and then this particular area second, and then deeper into this particular area. So even though you can approach these areas however you please, in general, they still come one after the other. Boy, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Like we just talked about it, maybe. You start on the first level of the foundry, and then you go up to the second level of the foundry, and then you go down into the basement of the foundry. And in each one of those locations, you get hit with beats like these that are pretty much immune to your actual approach. Whatever you're actually trying to do in the game doesn't affect what you learn. By the time you're in the basement, you understand more or less what to expect, and maybe you won't be randomly killing everything. Maybe you'll have learned that there are survivors down there, and you'll approach that knowing that there are some people to talk to or whatever. Fundamentally, the issue here is that we still have to try and create a linear sequence for our players. Trying to have an emotional impact without having any lead up to it is really challenging. Now the good news is we've been using this kind of environmental storytelling as kind of a, a guest feature here, but in truth it doesn't have to be nearly that aggressive. If we wanted to make a nonlinear quest line where we learn about the vampire queen's desperate wish to return to being human but her failure to do it and she comes off as like She's not even a vampire anymore. She's some sort of creepy ghoul character where everything failed and everything everything is all screwed up now and she can't even barely retains any sentience and everything's horrible, whatever, right? If we want that impact to happen, then what we would do is we would arrange the world around her such that as you're passing through that world, you would naturally be drawn into the right headspace for that emotional beat to work. Now, we could do that by literally allowing her to tell her story or, you know, having a vampire that remembers when the queen was sane or whatever, and that will work well. But our primary motivation here is just to make sure that the player is in the right headspace. Because as you're wandering through an open world game, the player could be in any mood. They could be in a zany mood, they could be in a serious mood, they could be in an annoyed mood, they can be in any mood. So what you do is you set up the surrounding areas around the queen to put the player into the right kind of somber headspace. These areas are uh, derelict and abandoned, and the only people left here are desperate and ancient and have forgotten what it even means to build and to feel things. We don't have to write specifically beats about the queen's personal story. We will, because there's no reason not to, but we don't have to enforce those beats. The only thing we really need to enforce is the headspace. We want this connection to happen. When the player stumbles into the queen's throne room and they find this horrific ghoul with no sentience left to her, they're going to get that feeling. They're going to be like, oh yeah, this is what it's been leading up to. Even if they don't know the story, that feeling of being there will hit because they're in the right headspace to feel it. To me, this is the fundamental way that open world RPGs have to structure their world. If you have a big emotional chunk that you want to have hit, you've got to arrange the world around that emotional chunk to put the player in the right headspace to accept that kind of emotion. And it could be anything. It doesn't have to be some kind of grim reminder of a, a long-dead queen. It could be like, oh, there's happy children playing over here. Well, set up the world so that you're in the right headspace to see those happy children playing. 
And even if the player hang glides in, they'll hang glide in over that terrain that sets them into the right headspace. At least in theory. This is a big topic, and I've already been going on for oh, half an hour, so I'm going to stop here, but feel free to expand uh, on these uh, topics down below. See you around.